So while the road to civil war is really kind of this crescendo, really kind of this build up to the civil war storyline proper, the civil war storyline itself really kind of hits the ground running. As we begin our discussion on the civil war, we will see that we will basically go from zero to 60, that we will start the story and from the time we start to the time we end, it'll basically be nonstop. There really won't be very many slow moments. A lot of the slow moments that exist, exist outside of the Civil War storyline proper. They exist within the tie-ins. And the tie-ins is really kind of where you get the background story of what's going on. It really kind of fills in a few things. Now, for the most part, we're not really going to be discussing the tie-ins properly. We're really going to kind of be skimming over the ones that aren't really essential to progressing the Civil War story. And what I would encourage you all to do is to really kind of follow along with the tie-ins, if you can get your hands on them, is to really kind of read about the tie-ins and at the very least really kind of try to get a summary of them so you can follow along with the full Civil War storyline. Now, what we see with the story is that the new warriors have uh, really kind of come into contact with some supervillains. They are trying to catch them by surprise as they invade their home in the suburb of Stamford, Connecticut. But what we see is that they're really kind of caught out of their league. These guys are really a lot more powerful than they had initially expected. And in fact, one of the supervillains, a villain named Nitro, uh, really kind of self-detonates and blows up a huge portion of Stamford. The initial casualties are expected to be around 600. But as we'll see with the, the progression of the uh, Civil War storyline, the actual casualties end up being well over a thousand. Now, initially, uh, around 60 to 70 or maybe even as many as 100 people who were killed are composed of children. And so from here, we really kind of see this public backlash. Now, after the events of Nitro uh, destroying a huge portion of Stamford, we switch to the Office of National Emergency alongside the Avengers and the X-Men, who are really kind of assisting in cleanup. And they're really kind of trying to find survivors or at the very least, try to find some bodies. Now, from there, this is when we really kind of get into the ramifications of the event, and we really kind of see things begin to move at a very fast clip. We get a, a couple panels of She-Hulk being interviewed on CNN, and the way that she takes this is really kind of interesting. Initially, she's really kind of against the idea of just arbitrarily rounding up superheroes. She really kind of feels it's preposterous, but the idea of, uh, at the very least, kind of regulating them, of requiring them to register themselves, and to really kind of be uh, government regulated isn't necessarily something that she is against. Now, one of the more interesting aspects is when we switch to the funeral for the many people who had been killed in the events of Stamford, Connecticut. And of course, we see one of the victim's mother really kind of lashing out at Tony Stark and really kind of screaming at Tony Stark and, and yelling at him that it's his fault, that everything that had happened to this point was really kind of on their shoulders. And this is when we see the anger and the irritation of humanity on behalf of superheroes really kind of coming out because up until this point when we saw events unfolding when we saw various conflicts taking place that resulted in the destruction of cities or things like that it was really kind of superheroes showing up they were fighting the fight they were destroying the villain and there was really no consideration for the amount of damage that was caused there was really no consideration for the possible casualties that had been caused it was really kind of this argument that the ends justify the means now not all of the superheroes really kind of agreed with this mindset especially when it came to people like Captain America. But the fact that there was no real ramification because of the fact that the government had never really stepped in and said, okay, enough is enough, people began to really kind of develop this perception. And they really kind of began to believe that there's really no one holding these superheroes accountable. And so at this point, we really kind of see the tide begin to change, where in the Road to Civil War storyline, we had talked about the events and really kind of the uh, congressional meetings between Congress and Tony Stark and Spider-Man and the 50-50 split between those who were supportive of 
of superhuman registration and those who were against it, we see the tide turn to where it's a far more lar a much larger group of people who are in support of superhuman registration than those who were against it. Now, from here, we see, you know, I guess you can kind of consider the first casualty of the uh, the backlash of the anger of humanity when we see that Johnny Storm is attacked in a nightclub and he is beaten unconscious and actually put into a coma. Now, at this point, we really kind of jump to a major meeting that is taking place. And this is really this is really kind of important because this is when we really kind of see battle formations forming. We really kind of see lines being drawn in the sand. We see the Avengers, the Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, among other superheroes, meeting at the Baxter building to really kind of discuss whether or not registration is something they can go through. We see, of course, Daredevil says that things are never going to be the same. And uh, we see that people are either avidly against it or they're avidly in support of it. There really is no middle ground here. There really isn't anyone who's kind of like, well, let's just wait and see what happens. Uh, we really kind of see people drawing lines in the sand, and we actually see some individuals who had previously been friends really kind of splitting up and going separate ways. And this, I think, is really kind of one of the more pivotal points and really kind of one of the reasons why this series was called the Civil War. Now, from this point, we jump to Captain America, and Captain America has really kind of been issued an ultimatum by S.H.I.E.L.D. as it's being led by Maria Hill. And Maria Hill really kind of tells him the direction that things are going in is that you guys are going to have to be registered. You're going to have to sign up and really kind of uh, tell the government who you are and you're going to be regulated. It can either be easy or it can be difficult. Of course, Captain America, who is always on the side of freedom, elects for the difficult path. He overpowers all of the S.H.I.E.L.D. agents, including Maria Hill, and then goes underground. Now, this is extremely important when Captain America goes underground. And the reason why is because as we transition, we'll see that the general public is in front of the White House and they're avidly in support of registration. And we see that Iron Man is meeting with the president, along with several other uh, political and military officials. And Iron Man goes as far as to say that the problem here is that with Captain America being underground, people who are against registration now have a figurehead. They have someone they can rally around. And so now they will not be as diverse and separated and as easy to uh, conquer, more or less, as they would have previously been. Because not only do they have a figurehead, they have the figurehead. They have the one guy that would be the best person to use to rally anyone to a particular cause in the form of Captain America. And from this point, Point moving forward in the comics, what we'll see is basically kind of a rush. We'll see a race taking place between Captain America and Iron Man, where each one is attempting to divvy up superheroes. Initially, they start with the most popular person, the most popular people, Ant-Man and, and so on and so forth. And then they kind of work their way down the line and they begin to pretty much go for whoever they can get. We also see them enlisting the aid of individuals who are a little less savory, in addition to individuals who really kind of are in the middle of the road and, and really aren't sure which direction they want to take. And we'll really kind of see that come to fruition with uh, the X-Men. Now, as far as the tie-ins are concerned, I would say probably one of the most important tie-ins between uh, Civil War issue number one and Civil War issue number two is the Amazing Spider-Man issue number 532. And the reason why is because as we saw with the road to Civil War, Iron Man had enlisted the aid of Peter Parker. He had told Peter Parker that he needs him really more than anybody else to be on his side. And the reason why is because Spider-Man is a very well-recognized figure in the superhero community. And for the most part, if Spider-Man will go along with it, people will lend a little more credence to it than they normally would have, just because of the fact that he is really kind of always fighting on the side of good, and he is always trying to help people as best he can, even if it's at the risk of his own personal detriment. And as we progress through this comic, we will ultimately see at the end that Spider-Man will stand in front of the press and reveal himself to be Peter Parker. With that being said, I'm going to go ahead and bring this video to an end. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. If you guys have any suggestions for the future videos, or if you would like me to go more in-depth regarding the tie-ins, then please let me know. And I will catch you guys later. Peace.